Hi, this is Ibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I'm also the host of Moms Don't Have Time to Lose Weight, and I'm the editor of the anthology, which you should run out and buy, called Moms Don't Have Time to, a quarantine anthology. All proceeds of that book go to COVID-19 vaccine research. And I'm the editor-in-chief of Moms Don't Have Time to Write, a new publication on Medium, and we're accepting submissions, so please send your personal essays there. And if all that isn't enough, you can follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens, and my website is zibbyowens.com. Okay, now back to this amazing podcast. Good morning. I am Marjorie Schuster, and I am the coordinator of our literary events at Temple Emanuel. Welcome to our series, Women on the Move, where we talk to female authors and we hear all about their lives, their choices, and their books. Today is very special for us, as we have the great honor of hosting the esteemed author, Joyce Carol Oates. Joyce really needs no introduction, but I will offer a few highlights. She is the author of 58 novels, 30 collections of short stories, eight volumes of poetry, plays, and other nonfiction works. Her literary awards are huge. They range from Pulitzer Prizes to Penn O. Henry and Penn Faulkner Awards to several Lifetime Achievement Awards in literature. Today, she's here to talk about her latest books, American Melancholy, Melancholy Book of Poetry, and The Other You, a series of short stories all about life's choices. And that theme is that has been at the heart of our series. Our moderator is Zibby Owens, creator of the podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read, and recent author, author of the new book, Moms Don't Have Time To. As usual, please type your questions in the chat feature, and I'll read them to Joyce towards the end of the conversation. Now, it is my great pleasure to turn the conversation over to Joyce Carol Oates and Zibby Owens. Welcome. Thanks, Marjorie. Thanks for having me. Welcome, Joyce. Welcome, Zibby. I will turn uh, off my video and uh, enjoy your conversation. Hi, how are you? I feel like I can't just call you Joyce. I feel like, I don't know, that seems way too informal. So- um, Joyce is fine. Okay, I'm delighted to meet you. Thank you for doing this program with the Stryker Center. Um, I am a huge fan of yours and your latest works were truly unbelievable, American Melancholy and The Other You. Um, I was hoping that as an introduction, you could talk a little bit about why you decided to write these two, especially as they released the same month and why these two stories, why these two now? And I know that the, that maybe we could start with the poems, which I know came from a lot of different places and you decided to aggregate them. And, um, let's talk about that if that's okay. Well, yes, for me, my primary, um, means of creative expression, I suppose one could say, is prose fiction. So I don't write poetry every day. Usually my periods of writing poetry are sort of very intense interludes of emotional crisis or stress where everything is distilled and, and very concentrated. The kind of energy that you need, perhaps for most people to write a novel, it's sort of like a long distance runner. And sometimes you have energy for short sprints and things that are, that are much more concentrated. So I don't really write poetry continuously. The, the poems in that collection were written in very intense interludes. And really the, the American melancholy is drawn together by the fact that my husband, Charlie Gross passed away in April 2019. So the book that I've, I've collected these poems have very much to do with, with the concentration of emotion of, of grief and loss and, and looking back at our culture in the, the 20th century and focusing on subjects like, I have a little section of poems on what we could call scientific malpractice or scientific misconduct and some quintessential famous research experiments. But the book is it's actually bookended by, with poems that are about the loss of my husband. So a book of poems, I think for many poets is an occasion for some intensity and distillation 
I can't really imagine that I would have another book of poems. This, this is my first book in 25 years. Wow. Well, the way you wrote about your husband's, and I'm so sorry for your loss, um, was absolutely beautiful per usual. But even the way you wrote about the hospice experience in the poem at the end, um, do you mind if I read a line or two from it? Is that okay? That's fine. Uh, um, when you said, uh, first you have it from your point of view and you alternate one, two, three, four, et cetera, with his point of view. Um, and you said, um, here, I'll start here. And so on the brink of too late, when no one else is in the room for a hospice room can be crowded by crowded, meaning more than two people, you tell your husband that you love him so much. What a wonderful husband he has been. And he says, but I failed you by dying. And you protest, but why are you saying such a thing? You are not dying. We are talking here together. And he says, because I am dead. As after the final biopsy, he'd been incensed. They took my soul from me. They took me to the crematorium. I saw the sign. Don't try to tell me I didn't see the sign. And then you say, trapped in this bed like a prison. Is the car out, friend? Drive the car around. Where are the keys to the car? Joyce, don't leave. Joyce, we need to get the car. Where are the keys? I want to go home. Take me home, Joyce. Don't leave me. What did we do with the car? And then at the end, you say, after such struggle, you must love the unrippled dark water in which the perfect cold O of the moon floats. Oh, it's beautiful and heartbreaking. And I'm so sorry. Thank you. When you were reading that, I almost didn't remember that I had written some of that. I probably am afraid to look at it. <laughs> I, I shouldn't say that. I mean, I've looked at it many times, but maybe not for months. Mm -hmm. Some things that, you know, though we write them ourselves, we can't really bring ourselves to read them. I mean, that's been true of a lot of my writing where the emotions are sort of pushed away by time. And then if you see them again, it becomes very fresh. So I almost couldn't believe I had written that. Of course, it's pretty much real life. Yeah. Oh. Do you feel like it helps you when you're in the moment? Does it help you sort out your feelings when you write scenes like this and put them in, in poetic form? Well, I'm really haunted by certain subjects. And so I would say I'm literally, I mean, literally haunted in the sense that my thoughts just careen around like a, in a whirlpool. And I try to, through meditation or other attention to draw away from from these areas of like gravity mm -hmm. like this intense whirlpool and sometimes I can do that and sometimes I can't so I sort of concentrate on expressing what what seems to want to be expressed so I think that's true for many writers I mean looking back at 20th century, you know, famous writers like Eugene O'Neill. Mm -hmm. He was obviously obsessed with his parents. He wrote so much mm -hmm. about his father. Uh, Hemingway mm -hmm. wrote about obliquely women mm -hmm. who were maybe like his mother. Uh, we all have mm -hmm. areas of being haunted. So writers are those mm -hmm. people who focus on it, mm -hmm. maybe trying to exercise mm -hmm. it or maybe just trying to explore it. Wow. Well, I found it interesting that you not only delved deep into your own loss, and just to clarify from the chat, I was reading from American Melancholy, the book of poems. Um, and not only did you do this, but you literally inserted yourself as the subject in many psychology experiments. And having been a psychology major way back in the day, uh, to, to read these from the point of view of the subjects and to even get more information on you know, some of the, the researchers themselves and your thoughts onto why they were even doing this, like the relation of the Holocaust. And um, why don't, why, maybe you could talk a little bit more about Maslow and um, uh, the Holocaust tie-in to what you were talking about in, in the poem. Well, that's I'm sorry, Stanley not Maslow, Mil Milgram, Milgram, not Maslow. That's, maybe that's that didn't Stanley sound right. Milgram. Well, Maslow is another person that I could write about maybe some other time I'm interested in, in him also. But Stanley Milgram was Jewish and he was a young assistant professor, I think at Yale. He was probably like many, many Jews. He was haunted by the phenomenon of the Holocaust and probably I would surmise many of his European uh, relatives probably perished in 
in the death camps. So Stanley Milgram, as a young psychologist, wanted to try to understand that phenomenon, mm -hmm. how we know that Hitler was insane, he was a homicidal maniac, and maybe the high-ranking Nazis were, but the, the Nazi phenomenon could not have taken place without the cooperation of average people, average German citizens, that a large, uh, it's almost like an industrial uh, apparatus of the so-called final solution that required many, many, many people, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of cooperative Germans. So Stanley Milgram as a young research psychologist wanted to understand how anybody could follow orders the way these people did. And so the famous or infamous series of experiments called Studies in Obedience that made Stanley Milgram very famous and very notorious. And he didn't get tenure at Yale. I think the backlash against him for exposing something about human nature that people didn't want to accept. That's, he really suffered in the backlash and he, he actually wasn't kept on at Yale. He may have gone somewhere else you know, equally prestigious. I'm not remembering if he went to Columbia or someplace. So people <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, but Stanley Milgram, I thought was just a, astonishing as a, just as a psychologist, very interesting. At the same time, we feel in looking at his, his experiments that he too was experimenting with people. He wasn't telling them quite the truth at all. He wasn't, he wasn't telling his subjects that they were being experimented on. So maybe in a way he was trespassing. That's what, that's the, uh, probably the bottom line of that poem that I wrote, that I wrote is questioning Milgram himself. Well, and I think that's one of, one of the themes that you touch on in so many of these poems is who has the right to exert sort of their own theories on other people and their own will on other people, whether it's uh, a, a man not treating a woman right in a relationship or a science experiment or any of these ways. I feel like you're meditating on the meaning of power and what makes someone sort of a victim as well. I feel like it was just kind of coursing. And then of course, as you said, bookended with your own loss to make you know, a very powerful package of, of reflections designed to really make the reader think through all of that. Well, you said you were a psychology major, so you obviously studied the famous experiment, Little Albert. Yes. And the conditioning, how easy it is to condition. And the noise, really the, the bright, you know, you the loud noise, yes. You can condition anyone of any age, but particularly an infant, who had no volition and had no protection. His mother really sort of gave him over to this experiment. Of course, his mother, I think, was a cleaning woman and she only got, she was paid like one dollar. Or, you know, it was very sad. But little Albert was a, he was a victim of a, an experiment we would consider incredibly cruel today. And of course, you point out nobody deconditioned all the subjects in all of these studies. No one took the time to get them sort of back to normal. Instead, they just sort of let them into the world to fend for themselves. Um, it is yeah. amazing. Well, John Watson is considered the, the father of American of advertising. Mm -hmm. You know, the advertising was a, co a commercial repli replication and application of the mm -hmm. ideas of Pavlovian conditioning on human beings, where you condition them to purchase your, your, your Cadillac or your deodorant or your shampoo. And you're doing that with images that are usually visual. And it's usually like in a magazine or, or later on television. Whereas the original experiments are, of course were in the lab and they were actually with people, with living people. Wow. The other poem I loved in this collection, by the way, um, was when the couple was, you called it too young to marry, but not too young to die, about the couple that you said, together beneath the ice in each other's arms, Jean Marie's head rested on Troy's shoulder. Their hair had floated up and was frozen. Their eyes were open in the perfect lucidity of death. 
calmly they sat upright, not a breath. Um, just so beautiful. And then you said, um, yet you could believe they might be breathing for some trick of scintillate light revealed tiny bubbles in the ice and emotion like a smile and Jean Marie's perfect fate. So it was about a couple that fell into the ice and this couple is young and you said, you know, they weren't even old enough to get married and yet they were hugging each other and like, they seemed so happy and eyes wide open as they faced death together. I don't know, it was the image. It reminded me of like the scene in the Titanic movie when the couple is sort of spooning in bed and the water is coming and they're just at peace clutching each other. And I just feel like, I don't know, it was just a perfect poem of love in all its form. Oh, thank you all, thank you all. That appeared originally in the, in the New Yorker and it had the sort of narrative look to it that it's like a, sto it's like a story that unfolds we, we uh, are told by somebody reminiscing about when he was in high school, uh, everybody was in awe of these very beautiful, handsome, this couple. You know, they were very beautiful. They were like the most popular couple and, and very envied. But then they had a kind of suicide pact because they weren't allowed to get married so young. So the boy drives them out, out into the ice, which becomes uh, th thinner as, as you move away from shore. And then the, the car broke through the ice and they, they sink down and they drown together in this sort of perfect union. And then the ice closes over above them so they could be actually seen through the transparent ice. And it's, it's like the way we, uh, we freeze memories like romance and nostalgia are frozen back in time. Probably there are no emotions quite as strong as our adolescent emotions. They're sort of frozen back there connecting with our, our high school, like the, the corridors and the stairways and the lockers and the classrooms of a high school for people who'd gone there are just fraught with emotion, all, all kinds of adrenaline. You know, somebody else looking at it sees nothing, but the people who were once there and once teenagers, they feel so strongly. Oh, I'm glad you said that because my kids who are in kindergarten and first grade go to that, my same school where I went to high school. And I often find myself like lost in my own memories walking through and have to be jolted back to the fact that somehow I have kids next to me who are, <laughs> who are like, how do I have kids? I feel like I'm 14 whenever I walk through the hallway. So yes, there's something about. Yeah, that's a wonderful image. I mean, I could see writing a poem about that you know, you're with your own children in this building and they are forming their memories and their emotions and you're right beside them. It's like the two generations and different decades and it's so rich. It's such a rich subject for a poem. I'm not such a poet, but maybe I'll try writing an essay about it now that you've inspired me to do that. You, can write, a, you can write a poem about it. <laughs> you, take you, it. Can, you can write a poem from the point of view of the person thinking it, who, who's not necessarily you. I mean, anybody can write poetry, I think, from a narrative voice perspective. Like, it's not you. It's not lyric poetry, but it's like a narrative monologue. You, you could certainly do that. Well, that's the question really about poetry that I, I, I wonder, and I was wondering while I was reading your collection is what necessarily makes it a poem? Could I take a paragraph that I wrote in an essay and if I change the form, would it become a poet, a poem? Like, how do you know it's a, po how do you know it's a poem? I know that sounds ridiculous, but per some lyrical language, if you morphed the form of it, I feel like could be more poetic but how do you know when you have a poem versus a paragraph? Well, it's a good question. Poetry is, a, is essentially very experimental. Working with language, I think that you can take any passage that you care about. You know, you have to have some emotional investment. That is the secret of poetry. When we read poetry like Shakespeare or Mary Oliver or Sharon Olds or Henri Cole, we're sort of reading this encapsulated intense emotion that's been really polished and maybe like a stone that's that's been made smooth and, and aesthetically beautiful. It's not raw emotion. It's not like somebody screaming, you know, but it's been sort of shaped. So anything that you personally care about, you could work into a poem 
if you took time, you know, it's a, med it's a meditative act. Uh, much of my writing time is spent walking or running and thinking. In other words, maybe 80% of writing is, is thinking beforehand of the tone that you want and just trying to choose the sort of vocabulary. The actual writing time is secondary. So how, tell me about your running. How much, how much running do you do? Well, I try to run every day. When it's cold, I don't go out as, as much. And I sometimes I run and walk and run and walk, sort of walk very fast. If I'm with other people, I walk. I have some women friends with whom I go walking. In the pandemic, we, we meet two or three times a week and we just sort of walk, no matter how cold it is, we sort of bundle up just to get exercise. And when I run alone, it's, it's more beneficial for my writing. When I'm with other people, I tend to be, you know, we tend to be talking, which of course is distracting. So you don't and in, do in, warm in warm weather, I can, I can run quite a bit. And I, I would go out every day, usually in the late afternoon. And I sort of think about my writing. I, I live outside Princeton, about four miles. It's a semi-rural area, there are country roads. So I can be running past pastures of sheep and uh, cattle it is, it is kind of, uh, there are farms here. Wow. Do you listen to music or you just let your thoughts gestate? Oh, I wouldn't listen. No, I wouldn't listen to music. I would do just, you have to think and concentrate on, on your writing. Hmm. Wow. And you don't have any pain. I'm like astounded by this <laughs> running of it because it hurts my knees and I'm like, you know, in my forties, but anyway. No, I don't have any pain. But I found that if I have pain like in the knee a little bit, if I just don't run on it for a couple of days, it goes away. But I think that we have to be careful. If you have a little bit of pain in your knee, many people just want to keep on running and saying, well, it's like, I won't let this stop me or it's nothing. But I think that's a mistake. I think the best thing is to stop running for, for a couple of days. Wow. Um and then your other recent book, The Other You, the opening story in this collection was so interesting. It was literally like what I think about all the time is what could my life have been like? What if I hadn't have had kids? You know, what if, and of course you pin it on a moment where um, a woman ends up not taking this exam that she should take and that she would have aced because she was super smart. And um, there becomes like Uville versus the other alternative of life, which everybody must think about from time to time. What if, what if this had happened at this moment? Would I not have had my kids? What would have happened to them? What if I, you know, what if, what if, what if? Um, tell me about know, this. It's, it's amazing. And I think the pandemic and being in quarantine and isolation for a year has made many of us really think about alternative lives. Yeah, well, it's not only that, but you, you know, I don't know how you met your husband, but say you met your husband at a university or you got introduced by somebody, it would be very easy not, not to have met. <laughs> you know, like, what would your life be? Obviously, we'd still be alive, but we would have lives that were radically different from the lives that we have. I actually, I'm divorced and remarried, and sometimes... I keep marveling at the fact that my life has become the other life that I wondered if I could have. And I literally like sometimes drive down the same street with my oh. second husband and the two kids I had later in life and at living in a different house. And I think, I can't believe that I was like, it was just me, you know, 10 years ago, driving down the street in a different car and living in a different Amazing. house. Yeah. It's really Where crazy. Where do you live? Well, I, I live in New York City, but I was talking about, um, you know, in, in Long Island, out in the Hamptons, where I grew. I've been going since 1979, so <laughs> um, so I've been traveling the same streets this whole this whole time, and um, yeah, it's. Yeah. Getting... I have a well, I have a similar situation because the house I live in now, with my second husband, is only f about three minutes away from the house that I lived in with my first husband, who died, Ray Smith. He died in 2008, and uh, that's, I go by that house all the time. I drive, I go out of my way to go by that house, and I remember 
my life there. And I have a kind of dreamlike nostalgia how I could actually walk in that door and that the house would be there and all the rooms come back. And then my, my first husband would be in his, his office where he was, he was an editor. And like everything is like a hallucination, but then it's actually 2021, you know, and not only have I lost that first house, but I lost my second husband. And so I'm in this house alone and it, every, life seems to be so like a dream, I think because, partly because of the isolation of the past year. And yet, you know, we're still here and we're still living our lives. Wow. Um, it's crazy that on top of all of this and the loss and everything, that then everyone has to be thrown into this period of time where you have to rethink everything because you're alone with your thoughts for so much of it as well. Um, it's almost, it's like a cruel joke in a way, but anyway well for but for you you've probably been in quarantine with a family so probably you have a lot of um, a lot of attention paid to ch the children i mean probably it's been you haven't been alone as much as somebody else so you probably have had a different kind of a radically different kind of experience Yes, I have. Uh, there have been moments where I would have loved to be alone. <laughs> um, yes, I've been, you know, my kids have mostly been in remote school for this whole time. And I have four kids. And um, yeah, it's a lot. It's, um, I have not had a lot of time alone. Um, so, uh, but everybody, everyone, everyone's plate has been sort of rearranged. Um, we've all had to learn how to sort of eat again, <laughs> if you will, during this during this time. Yeah, so. and I, I, would, I would guess that you as a mother have found time maybe late at night or early in the morning when people are sleeping, <laughs> that you found some special sacred quiet time for yourself. Well, honestly, that's part of why I love doing these interviews um, and why I love doing my podcast and meeting people like you and having conversations because while this isn't alone time per se, it's when I talk to people, that's how I get in touch with like who I am when I'm not, you know, picking up toys or doing the laundry or all these like day-to-day -day things like this is such a yeah. gift. It's like connects me, not just to the person I'm talking to, but to myself. I don't know if you feel that way when you yes. talk to others. Yes. Well, I remember my friend, Toni Morrison, when she was my colleague at, at Princeton, she had a busy life and she was teaching and so forth. So she would get up at five in the morning and do her writing. She would sort of get up early and do her writing. That's you know working on novels like Beloved. In other words, she found a time. Probably she would rather have been asleep, you know, like most of us. But Tony found a time that was sort of sacred time, and I try to do that too. Uh, I I find that because I don't have a a domestic schedule, I can uh, I can waste a lot of time, you know. When, when my husband was living and we had more of a schedule, we would do things together. And of course we were out in the world at that time. My life was a matter of a da daily schedule. And so I would get a lot of writing done. But now with an open sort of timelessness, you think, well, I have all day long to work on my novel. So maybe I'll do this chore first or answer some emails. In other words, if you're more busy and connected with other people in the world, I think you actually get more done. Yeah, it's like give a give a busy person something to do and it'll get done in two seconds. But <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. are you working on a novel now? Oh, yes, I have been working on a novel very intensely since the pandemic began. I think that it's been a great silence and putting together the poems for uh, American Melancholy and using the, the photograph on the cover of the book is a photograph taken by Charlie, my husband, of Lake George, which is his, was his favorite place in all the world. And there are two little duck, you can just sort of see oh, yeah. a duck couple. <laughs> like that's supposed to, it's so melancholy, these two little, this little couple of, du of ducks on this choppy lake is sort of like, symbolic of, of, the, of the marriage, I suppose. And it seemed like just the perfect cover for that particular book. And the predominant tone is melancholy, but there are some poems that are meant to be funny, like the one about the cat, 
the different kind of cat, do, cat or old dog or old, you know. And there are a few, and the one about Marlon Brando is supposed to have some humor in it. So it isn't all melancholy. And then also with the other you, the story called The Unexpected, where the young, the woman writer, she's not young any longer, she goes back to her hometown, which is the hometown of the first story, Uville. And then she meets these people who like, went to high school and grade school with her. And they're all so jealous and mean. <laughs> and they keep asking her these awful questions. You know, are you sorry that you didn't have any children or are you alone or could you do your career over again? Or, or you know, the questions that they put to her are really kind of niggardly and nasty. And uh, all that is meant to be somewhat funny, you know, in a dark, humorous way. Even the one about the friend waiting for her friend to show up late at the restaurant at the vegan place. And you're like, they didn't even really love vegetarian food, but you know, like they thought they should be there. Uh, um, and even yeah. how you, you kind of joke that the one of them had another child because the other had another yeah. child and they were funny. Well, I think that women, women friends who have known each other a long time are really like sisters and they're very supportive emotionally. And there's a, there's a a kind of a quiet intensity. The friendship goes on for so many years that they know each other so well. Some of the bonds are even stronger than between a husband and a wife because the wife doesn't always want to tell the husband, you know, some things where you're more likely to tell a a woman friend. Uh, We, my friends and I, we call ourselves like the girlfriends it's hard to believe that we're well beyond being girls because there's a kind of girlish connection of uh, often humor and you know teasing and playfulness that you'll find among women friends. But the, the women friends, that story is one of my favorites. And there are three stories in the collection all set at the same vegetarian restaurant. It's a place that I knew in, in Berkeley that Charlie and I would go to. A kind of one of these menus with all this, you know, lots of kale, <laughs> lots of organic and, and things that don't sound, <laughs> they don't really sound very appetizing, but they're, they're politically correct. <laughs> um, although you end up having like a bomber show up at this restaurant. So um, in the past, and there's a lot of history to the restaurant in the story. So um, it's not yeah, exactly like a sweet up. green either. <laughs> In each story, he shows up some way in each story. One story, he, he seems to be there. Another story, he has been there. And another story, you, you sort of hear what he's thinking is he himself is so dissociated. Like he wants to set off a bomb and he wants to cause a, a, a catastrophe, but he doesn't really comprehend that he's going to die. Like he sort of thinks to himself, well, this isn't really going to happen, is it? You know, like I, I didn't do very well in chemistry and science in high school. I'm really not going to be successful. And I think probably a lot of people who do desperate things, maybe including suicide, a part of their brain is thinking, well, this is not really going to happen. You know, I'm just going to sort of play through the gesture, which is somewhat theatrical. I mean, suicide bombing is so theatrical. You know, it's, it probably rarely achieves any kind of goal at all, except to destroy human life. That I'm, there must be some element of dissociation that the person doesn't really think he's dying. Or with some religious uh, oriented or politically religious oriented suicide bombings that they actually think they're going to go to heaven. So they're going to be in some other dimension they don't really think they're just going to be uh, annihilated. So with any kind of uh, suicide gesture, there must be some element of hallucination and fantasy. So when you, <clears throat> when you start a new project as sort of a living literary legend who's won all these awards and you must feel a sense of accomplishment and confidence in your writing, when you start something new, do you feel do you ever feel worried like that it's not going to be good or like your luck is run out or do you approach everything like knowing what you want to say or like what is it like when you start a new project like the novel you're working on now? 
Well, let's say that writing is a kind of activity. It's, it's cerebral and also em emotional. So you know that you're gonna do some writing if, if you're a writer, like next Monday, you're gonna be writing. So you have this sort of a ferocity of yearning to, to be creative. So what, what are you gonna do with that? You know, it's like harnessing some power. Are you gonna work on a poem? Are you gonna work on a short story? Or are you gonna work on a novel? You're sort of choosing what to do with this yearning to, to write or to compose something. But if you're haunted by a subject, you're probably going to be limited to writing about that particular subject. If you look at the very last paintings in Van Gogh's life, which are very thick, the paint, the brush strokes are very thick and they're all natural scenes like of the sky and the landscape, every in the sun or flowers, it's everything very thick. You can feel that the artist Van Gogh was totally in the throes of a, a kind of dream-like intensity of emotion that maybe he couldn't really control. So it's a kind of benign compulsion. I say it's benign because it's productive. It's not that somebody is just washing their hands you know, over and over again in, in a non-productive way. So if you are a writer, and I'm friendly with Margaret Atwood, we're almost the same age, and we sort of came of age in Canada. When I lived in Canada, Margaret was a rising, I mean, very rapidly rising poet, and I was writing prose fiction books. But I think Margaret Atwood probably shares with me this feeling that you never really have mastered anything. You, know, you do know from the past that if you work at it, sort of diligently every morning, you know, as long as you can, you will achieve something. But you don't know how hard, how hard it will be. You don't know how long it will take. You don't know how miserable you might be. So it's about, to answer your question, it's both something that's, that is familiar because you've done it before, but unpredictable because you don't really know what it's going to be. Uh, a, a writer who's written novels is challenged not to repeat herself. So each novel should be stylistically different. I try to make my novels different from one another. If I have a long novel like Night, Sleep, Death, the Stars is my, my most recent long novel. I'll just, I could show you this is over here. So th this is a really long novel. You can see how long, you can see that this, this is a family novel with about with the parents and about five children. So my next novel, which is coming out in August, is much shorter. It's about a marriage after the husband has has died. It's very much a sort of mem memoirist novel, which is really only about two people, with you know some pe people in the background. Whereas this long novel is about, about seven people and I'm moving from one person to the other and has a lot to do with, uh, with politics in America right now. The new novel is very intense and, and limited to two people, almost nothing, really almost nothing at all about politics in America. Mostly emo the emotional intensity of losing a spouse, being unable to save the spouse, in any way, and then being haunted. Now, most of the novel is about the aftermath of a loss and how we're haunted by grief, but in the novel, literally haunted by thinking she sees the husband, and maybe she really sees the husband, you know, we don't really know. So that's an example of how, because you've written one thing, the next, the next thing you do might be much shorter or the next thing you do might be a book of nonfiction. It's sort of reacting against what you've done most recently. Hmm. It sounds like it could be a play. You know, can't you see it? Maybe no, can... no, it couldn't. It really couldn't be a play because it has a it has a lot of uh, hallucinatory passages that are very dreamlike, and they're in this unfamiliar setting. I think that losing somebody 
takes you to a new, a new world. And literally they're in, uh, they're in New Mexico. They're in a place sort of like Santa Fe, but not, it's not Santa Fe, but it's like Santa Fe. And the landscape is that beautiful, the beautiful landscape of, of New Mexico, which is really inhuman. You know, it's an austere, red, russet, red, mountainous landscape without much green in it. Mm. And it's sort of like Georgia O'Keeffe country, very austere and sort of lunar. It's like you're on, a, on the moon or on another, on the Mars or someplace. So that's where this, this novel sort of plays out. Whereas the novel that I've been showing you is actually set right, much of it's set right in the room I'm in right now because, it, because it's very much an autobiographical novel. And the widow in this novel is living in a house like my house. So I've done some Zoom inter interviews about this novel, which is so weird because the woman in the novel is in this room a lot and I'm literally in the same <laughs> the same room. Um, what is the title? Someone's asking in the chat. What's the title of the novel going to be? Does it have one yet? Yes, it's called Breathe. Oh, I think it's going to be great. Yeah. Well, we all have the hospital vigil. I don't feel I'm the only one who's ever gone through it, but I have actually written about the hospital vigil in in the other you. You know, the hospice. Um, we all go through it. Um, well, you're at the hospital all day long and leave at night and come back in the morning and and you get to know the elevator you take and you walk down the corridor, you go in a certain room. It's so, I don't know, it's I guess a universal experience and each person suffers it or endures it alone. You know, we are all alone at the same time it's universal. Do you have any advice for someone just starting out who wants to be a writer or trying to be a writer? Well, I teach writing a writing workshop all every semester. I teach uh, in the fall, I teach at NYU and I teach at Princeton. And right now I'm teaching an, um, a course at, at Rutgers. Of course, they're all Zoom. In my course at Rutgers, I have about 15, uh, just by accident, all women, in fact, Margaret Atwood is going to visit our class today. And writers are people who've been reading. I think that we become writers because we read when we're young, when we're very young, and maybe our parents read to us with, uh, you know, children's books with pictures and the parent reads this little text and after a while the child has heard the story many times and the child starts to read. I think that's how parents teach their children to read, you know, in literate cultures. Did you do that sort of thing like reading to your children? I still do that type of thing, um, just like my mom did to me. And um, yes, I love it. And sometimes they're and like, they one more. They love it, but it, usually I'm so tired at that point of the night. I'm like, why do I always save this for the night when I'm my most tired? Why don't we read at like three in the afternoon when I'm full of energy? But, um, and they're like, they, don't, they, look. They, don't they like that? Don't they? They don't love they it. Particularly, not like they're all cuddling in bed yes. and then they fall asleep and their mother's reading to them. I think that's really lovely. Yes, no, it's nice. Um, and I try to remind myself when they ask for a second book, I'm like, it's not like they're asking for iPad time. Like I should give them a oh, second I, book. It's a second book. I wish, so I, had my children, I wish I had my children's book here to show you because I've, I've written a number of children's books, but they're in another room. So oh. <laughs> they're all about kittens. Oh, yeah. Each book is about a kitten. Love it. Well, I will, go, I will stock up on your children's books now that... <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think Marjorie's here for question time. Yes. I am. Thank you very much for that lovely interview. And we've had lots of people ask us questions. So I will start with a couple of the interesting ones. Um, somebody asked, when did you first know you were going to be a writer? Oh, I never really thought I would be a writer. I don't think there was ever any moment like that ever. When I was really little, before I could actually write, I was scribbling in notebooks and I did a lot of drawings, like 
we lived on a farm, so I, I draw uh, chickens a lot. I do a lot of chickens and cats. I mean, they were not very good drawings. I just seemed to be very eager to, you know, work with a pen, a pencil on tablet. And I, I have all these scribbles. It's sort of like Tolstoy couldn't write, but he wanted to write War and Peace, even though he wasn't literate. So it's just a page after page of scribbles. Mm -hmm. So I guess I started writing in, in a pre-literate state where I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> and then later on when I was in high school, I was encouraged to write by, by teachers who were very sympathetic. And I think that they sort of identified me as a, as a very um, enthusiastic reader. I did a lot of reading and I always would read for extra credit. We write little reports if you wanted to do extra credit. I don't know if that exists anymore in schools, but I always give extra credit. So I think I was encouraged by, by very uh, wonderful English teachers. Well, on that note, Pilar, it's an interesting question. Do you think you should, a writer is more of an introvert or an extrovert? She's talking about the differences between her and her family members. Well, we all have a degree. It's like being on a spectrum. Uh, some people are extremely intro introverted. I think we can assume that Emily Dickinson was extremely introverted in a productive and, and fertile and exciting way. You know, it wasn't that she was terrified of life. I think she preferred her own solitude. Many of her poems talk about, you know, turning the lock and turning the key in the lock and being alone in her room after a long day with the family and taking care of somebody in the house who might be ill. And so she would be one extreme. Then another extreme would be, uh, I think, a typical politician. Uh, there's a gregariousness, this expansive spirit. I don't know any politicians personally, but it's said that, that Bill Clinton, for instance, was a quintessential politician, that he remembered everybody's name. Like he would meet people over a period of years. And I met people who met him. And if he came back, he would say, how is your, you know, how's your son or how's your father? He could remember people's names and also what they talked about. That, that degree of extroversion is most unusual and most people don't have that. Many people are in the middle. They don't even necessarily remember faces, but extreme ex extroverts are gifted with neuro or neural logical apparatus where they remember faces and names, you know, just like that. And, okay. but introverts are often, uh, they're thinking their own thoughts, they're shy, they may have social anxiety, but then they may turn out to be brilliant painters or, you know, brilliant artists. That there's this, it's kind of compensatory. If you're gonna be president of your high school class in high school, you're probably an, an extrovert. And if you're like the class poet, you're probably an introvert. Where did you fall in that category? I was always so uh, interested in sports. So I was on sports teams all through high school. I was on the basketball team and the volleyball team and also the field hockey team. So that suggests a kind of extroversion. But at the same time, I was also a writer. Uh, I may be an extrovert for limited periods. There are people who are mostly introverts. All my colleagues at Princeton, my writer friends, are we're all in, introverts. But the extroversion is something you can do for a limited period of time, and then you want to come back to your own solitude. Janice had an interesting question. Is there any novel that is your favorite? Of my something own? Of your own, close to your heart. Or, or just anybody? No, yours. Oh. <laughs> Well, we tend to feel what we were working at at the present time is the most intense and up and immediate. Uh, this, this novel that I've been holding up is very close to my heart. The, the, the widow who's, who's the subject of the novel is pretty close to myself, except she de she's not a professor. She is a mother of five children, which is most amazing, you know, that I mean, I consider four children very, very ambitious, and wonderful, and five children, can't even imagine it. But yet it's in some ways a very, very personal novel. Sibby, I believe we spoke before, you wanted to talk a little bit about the upcoming film? 
Oh no, I just, um, I know that your, your novel Blonde is becoming a movie and I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Oh, let's see, I, I have this somewhere too. I... Yeah, that, this is the uh, 20th anniversary of this novel Blonde and in 2021, on Netflix, there is supposedly, I mean, there, there is, I guess, a movie adapted and directed by Andrew Dominic, a very uh, ac excellent, very artistic and idiosyncratic director, Andrew Dominic, blonde. I have seen it. I saw it. Yeah, I saw it. It's quite, it's quite riveting. It's a, it's an odd, well, I don't want to say odd, it's, it's a very imaginative. Andrew Dominic wanted to create a movie that was from the perspective of a woman, though he is a man, he is a straight male man, you know, straight male, white male. He wanted to create a movie that was unique and that it was from the point of view of a woman. So it'll be interesting to see what, you know, what feminists, what women, what actually women think about it. So I, I saw it and we talked on the telephone. I did not write the screenplay, he wrote the screenplay. And I said, you know, Andrew, this, this movie that I've seen is so frightening that I actually had to turn it off a couple of times and go away and come back. And I think I remember him saying that he had given it the intensity of a horror film. So he saw this novel as a kind of hor horrifying, terrifying work. That's his interpretation. I'm not sure that I would say that. Of course, the movie is an adaptation. It's not literally the whole novel. The novel is very long. It was, almost, it was 1,400 pages in manuscript. It was like a real epic of Marilyn Monroe's life and all the world around her, you know, her family and the, all the movies she did. I, I talk about the movies. But what Andrew did was focus on just like a thread, a thread of her relationship with her mother and then later on her relationship with some men. This might be a silly question based on how prolific you are, but do you ever get writer's block? Well, we all get, as Ian McEwen said, we get all periods where we, we're not ready to write, you know, like you're not prepared. Mm -hmm. That's why I said it's very important to go out for walks and be alone and just think quietly. You can't just say, I'm going to go and write like next Monday and start writing a novel. Right. You have to do a lot of thinking, quiet thinking beforehand. I would guess people who have writer's block are just not quite ready yet. Okay. You know, basically you have to think about it. Jeff had a question. Do you ever have a dream that turns into thematic material in your novels? Oh, very rarely. I have had a whole novel that evolved out of a dream, but it was very <laughs> difficult. And it's much harder to replicate something than it would be to make it up. Yeah. My novel, Mud Woman, completely evolved out of a dream. And for years, I mean, literally like five, six, seven years, I wanted to write that novel based on that dream. It took a long, long time to find a story and find a voice for it. I felt, I did feel haunted by the dream and wanted to explore it, but it was very difficult. It would be, it be easier just to make up a new novel. Mm. We had a question from Louise. She said she's Canadian and she'd like to know about your experiences in Canada. Well, that was a wonderful time in my life. I lived in Canada from 1968 to 1978. So I was avoiding, my husband, Ray Smith and I were avoiding the virulent America of the Vietnam War and the kind of war between the generations. like those who were in favor of the Vietnam War tended to be older, and those who were against it tended to be younger. I mean, there was a lot of overlap and so forth. But we, we didn't really want to live in the United States. It was, such a, it was such a terrible time. 
the, the country is divided now, but it was equally divided then. And, and I don't remember right now when Malcolm X was assassinated, but there was a lot of tur a good deal of turbulence, the Black Panthers, the civil rights movement and backlash against it. So we were living in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, and many of my students, by many, I probably mean like five or six, were conscientious objectors. They were Americans who came to Canada. They became Canadian citizens. They never went back and they loved Canada. Uh, Ray and I loved Canada. We lived on Riverside Drive East in Windsor along the, on the Detroit River. I loved my colleagues at, at the University of Windsor. My students were great. Overall, they were better prepared than American students. Canadian students were very good students compared to American students. I've been teaching in Detroit before that. So it's an interlude in my life that's very positive. I have a predilection for Canada and for Canadian writers, uh, kind of a, just a prejudice for, for Canada. And as I said, Margaret Atwood is a, is a friend whom I don't see very often, but I've been following her career all my life. I was following Alice Munro's career when she first began writing also. And Margaret Lawrence and Michael Ondaatje and wow. Barry Callahan and other Canadian writers. Wow. That's wonderful. A few people would just like to know a little bit about your day during the pandemic. Uh, you, you say you walk, you run, do you watch Netflix? Tell us a little more about your life. Well, I tend to write all day long and intermittently. I, I start pretty early in the morning. I should say that I'm so dominated. I'm really bullied. I have to say I'm bullied by two cats. They're not in the room at the <laughs> moment, but these two cats are sort of uh, they're very bossy. They wake me up at 5.30 in the morning, so they have to have breakfast. And then my day begins much earlier than, than I would wish. So I can start writing around seven or so, but then I write all day long intermittently. I'm doing other things, household chores, and I try to do some shopping. Eventually, I just have had the groceries delivered because we have a high, really high degree of uh, contagion in New Jersey, even right now, the like Mike, the county is like high alert for um, new cases. And New Jersey was very high immediately. One of the highest, along with New York City, I think immediately let, a year ago. So eventually I had the groceries uh, delivered. But ordinarily I like to go out and I like to shop and I would like to see people. Have you had the vaccine? I had the first shot. Uh, good. Oh, the question about what I do in the evening. Yes, in the evening, I've been watching classic films mostly. Oh. Some are on Netflix, but some are on American uh, Amazon Prime. So with a friend, virtually, not we're not in the same room, but with a friend, I've been watching classic American films. Like last night, I saw Born Yesterday. I've seen all, <laughs> I've seen every classic like Cary Grant, movie and and Tony Curtis and Sidney Poitier, all these great actors of the of the 20th century, uh, Clark Gable. I've been, I've been watching all these movies. So that is something that I probably would not be doing without the pandemic. So I work all day long and at 8.30 I stop. I stop around 8.30 every night and have sort of a late dinner, but my dinner is while I'm watching a movie. Very nice. I always like to ask this to people, um, are there authors that you particularly like to read? Well, I do a lot of reading. I mean, I have Margaret Atwood's new, new book of poems dearly here. Uh, I, I do a lot of reading just of new books that come to me. Sure. And I do a lot of reading of review books. I um, have projects like I'm going to be writing the introduction to a collection, a select the Dostoevsky short stories, the, you know, the best stories of Dostoevsky. So I'm rereading Dostoevsky. And then I'm, re I'm reading the Philip Roth biography by Blake Bailey right now. So my reading is sort of like what comes in the house. Right. 
Well, one of my all time favorite books, I'll just tell you on a personal note, is We Were the Mulvaney's. I've had a copy of that with me for a very long time. I've moved probably four times. It always comes along with me. It's on my bookshelf. Just wanted to let you know about that one. I'm trying that to see the- That was an Oprah. That was <laughs> yes, an Oprah selection. In, and Oprah's back. She's in the news right now. Yeah. Well, yes. She's amazing. Yes, <laughs> she's definitely in the news right now. I want to make sure we answered all of these questions. You see any other ones in there, Zibby? One question that's not in the chat, but a friend texted it to me. She was curious how you get your titles. Do you make them up or does the um, editors make them up? Oh, editors never make up titles. Uh, I don't think for anybody. None of, none of my writer friends, okay. no. I've never, I've never heard of that. An editor might not like a title or might ask to see a number, you know, but no, that's mostly just somehow it's a, a mystical thing. I think the title comes to you when the novel is coalesced. When you know what the novel's about, then you get the title like Night, Sleep, Death, The Stars is a line from Walt Whitman. Mm -hmm. And it just was perfect for this novel. Then the novel called Breathe Breathe is what you're saying to the person that you don't want to die. You say, you know, you know what, this person, the breath of life, you know, just that one word was always that title. Wow. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, there's a lot of great thank yous in our chat. Um, it's just wonderful to hear from you and to hear about you and, you know, our audience enjoyed it. And Zibi, as always, what can I say? You, uh, your interview style is fabulous and you really bring out the best in everybody. And I can't thank you both enough. And uh, this is, concludes this four part series right now of Women on the Move, but uh, we will, I'm telling this to our audience, we will start this again. We always like to find all the uh, wonderful female authors to talk to. And uh, please watch our website and you'll be hearing about our next ones. And thank you, Joyce. And thank you, Zippy. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music.